But I think, you know, a level of fun, a level of not taking ourselves too seriously, creating something that people want to be a part of. I mean, you've probably heard me say before, you know, making your content, moving it from interruptive to irresistible, like making, you know, what if you could make your sales content something people wanted more of? Like it's totally possible, right? In today's world of marketing and sales, we tend to think a lot about the question of how much? How much content can we produce this week? How many emails can we send out before they'll either respond or unsubscribe? How much more can we share on social to increase audience engagement? And while consistency in reaching your audience can be important, you may be missing the most important how much question of them all. How much would our audience be willing to pay for the content we're putting out there if we weren't giving it away for free? It's a different mindset that just may help you take your content and messaging from interruptive to irresistible. Welcome to Creating Connections the show that explores the human element in an increasingly digital business world. I'm your host, Tyler Lassard, and today we're speaking with Matt Hines, president of Hines Marketing, host of Sales Pipeline Radio, and smoker of some of the finest bacon in the Pacific Northwest. Matt's one of the leading voices on how to blend art and science to create better connections. And not only does he teach businesses how to do this effectively, but he also walks the talk when it comes to how Hines Marketing does their own go-to-market strategy. You know, what started, you know, 11 years ago with just, you know, me and a laptop and a bus pass. And I just, you know, I was just happy being a consultant. Now, you know, we've grown to about 14 people. And, uh, but, you know, 11 years in, we still don't have a sales team. I don't have a dedicated biz dev person. And I think part of the reason we've been able to grow and succeed is because we do have a pretty authentic voice. I think we've got good content. We think we've got pr good perspectives. And I say we, because it started out with just mostly stuff I was writing and creating. And now, you know, if you look at our blog, like I can't remember the last time I wrote something on our blog. It's mostly people on the team and I'm still doing content on LinkedIn and elsewhere. But to your point about art and science, you know, we didn't, I didn't really, I didn't have an editorial calendar to start with. I did not have a buyer's journey. Um, I just tried to listen to the market and listen to people and just, just speak from the heart. As you said, try to be authentic, share things that I think are interesting. And if other people think they're interesting, great. Um, and honestly, that's still the heart of our content strategy and my content strategy. Now, the science part comes in to say, OK, um, I, you know, for me to be able to engineer some consistent revenue for our organization, I have to have some consistent, predictable pipeline. So saying, how do I now take what what I want to continue to be an authentic, natural voice from a content standpoint and have some discipline around follow up with prospects, targeting of the right prospects. How much of that do I need to get to the right size pipeline to hit a certain number? Um, there very much is a lot of discipline on that behind the scenes for us. But, you know, I still don't want to break how we the approach we take from a content standpoint. So I think it's it's um, you know, we talk a lot internally with the work we do in our content that I want people to be excited to come to work in the morning but proud of themselves when they go home. And that's that's not just the work we do with clients, but also the way we represent ourselves in every facet of the business, including our content. Now, Matt has a unique perspective on how different brands, particularly those in business to business, are evolving their content strategies to create more authentic and emotional connections with their audiences. So I asked him about the most prominent trends that are influencing how successful marketing teams are approaching their content, messaging and go-to-market strategies. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, there there needs to be a greater discipline of right message to the right person at the right time. And I think that's part of the science is not just sharing whatever you feel like whenever you feel like to everybody, um, but knowing, you know, who are you trying to reach? What do they care about? What me what What's the situation you're reaching them in? And then what are you going to say? How are you going to say it? In what format are you going to say it? And what's the what's the most appropriate and natural next step for you and for them? So there's a discipline approach there. Um, I, I, I do think that B2B companies historically have been very formal in how they have then executed a lot of that content. So, you know, people historically, when they think about video, um, you know, get very formalized. I mean, there's a large company here in Redmond, Washington, um, that when you do video and webinars, like it's not this, like where we just like turned on our webcam, you go into a studio, you spend a half hour on makeup, they spend a whole 25 minutes right up here trying to buff out the shine. I mean, it's very, very formal. And then there's teleprompters, right? Like telling you what to say. And so I think that, you know, historically have been very polished, very sort of professional, 
um, content, whether it's the video or the white paper or whatever have you. So I think there's still a, a, an increased level of discipline around the precision of the message and the timing and the in the format. But increasingly, we are deformalizing the approach and the delivery, right? Where, you know, what used to be a white paper now might be a blog post. What used to be sort of a a position paper that took, you know, took forever edits now is sort of just a quick position. It might be just a LinkedIn update. It might be someone, we, we kind of make fun of the, you know, the walking, you know, video selfie, you know, I, I do at least. Um, but, uh, but I mean, what I love about at the core of that is someone that just pretty much turns on the camera and just, just speaks from the heart. And I think that's authentic. It's interesting. I mean, when you have people with interesting personalities and interesting things to say, it's more fun to watch that. It's more fun to listen to that. So, you know, I, 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 I don't think these things are diametrically opposed, but just to summarize, I think you've got an increased level of discipline around what, and then you've got an increased level of um, just authenticity in the way that it is created and, and uh, executed. If you look at what content marketing teams are publishing today compared to just five years ago, you can see the impact of these major trends. Less long form white papers, more blogs and social posts fewer formal documents, more short form updates and conversational content, less static information, more dynamic and rich media content. Having greater discipline in what you produce and deformalizing the approach is all about producing content that is of greater value, is more authentic and does more to earn the trust of your buyers. And it represents an important shift in the market from a brand to buyer mentality to a human to human mentality. So why is this happening now? Why are the new marketing and sales dynamics that are making new styles of informal content increasingly important today? Well, I would argue that this kind of this kind of approach may have worked very well 40, 50 years ago, um, but I think sellers were afraid to let it, to try it, right? And I think that buyers were okay with it because there weren't that many channels. There wasn't the internet, there weren't other sources of information. So you got these formal pieces of content. I mean, I. I have, a, I, have, I have copies of some of my father's old Caterpillar tractor collateral and there were no, there was no video, there was no thought leadership content. It was just, it was product stuff, right? And it was very formal and I'm sure it went through God knows how many different reviews um, to get there. I think today you have an increasingly skeptical and increasingly jaded and increasingly time-starved prospect um, that is not going to read a 20 page white paper. Um, I think you've got multiple channels that are accessible to people. I think we're now, you know, we live in an age where we're used to seeing YouTubers. We're used to seeing casual content and we like that. I mean, I think about the podcasts I listen to are those that are probably the least structured, you know, smart people that know their topic. But like, I'm thinking about one that is, I got, the, I got, I got one about college football. I got one about cooking. I got one about the Bible and they're, none of them are well scripted. Like they're all just, there's a topic and there's a format, but it's, it's, it's just, it's fun. It's, it's like you're listening to a couple of people have a conversation at a coffee shop. And so I think we, I think we relate well to that. And I think in, in a world when, you know, it's just, you know, where we've got so many different channels thrown at us all the time, we are gravitating towards that, which feels more familiar and comfortable. And I think that that's, that, that, you know, de, 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 deconstructed kind of a format and approach works really well. It's interesting to hear Matt describe the marketing challenge in that way. In essence, we now have audiences who are skeptical and time-starved and who are gravitating towards channels and content formats that feel familiar and comfortable. So we all need to be prepared to meet them in the middle with content that is genuine and trustworthy, is deserving of their time, and feels highly relatable. So when the rubber hits the road, how does this impact the way we produce our content and plan out our go-to-market programs. Well, I, I think diversity of channels is really important, you know, because different people learn different ways, different people access information different ways. Uh, you know, I, we also know through research that diversity of channels is not as important as integration of channels when you're communicating across not just email and social and video, but across sales and marketing, right? So when you've got a consistent message and approach across multiple channels, you're much more likely to increase velocity of customer attention, interest, and eventually engagement and conversion. Um, 
And I, and I think, you know, again, like, you know, this, I'm kind of a broken record on this, but like the formats and channels that you use have to be something that's relevant to your audience. Um, if you've got an audience that doesn't have a lot of time, don't make them sit through an entire hour long webinar. Like I did a webinar this morning with a couple companies and it was like a 22 minute webinar. And we're like, oh my God, is this too short? It's like, no, it's perfect. Give people their eight minutes back, let alone the other 30 minutes that they're usually sitting there, right? I mean, if we've got something to say, it's kind of like your typical hour long meeting, like no meeting takes exactly 60 minutes, right? Like it either is too long or too short. Um, so, I, and I think from a format standpoint too, like figure out what people are comfortable with. I like, I am like, again, like historically I'm a, I'm a, I'm a print journalist. I like the written word. I'm comfortable with it. I've become increasingly more comfortable with, you know, we've got our podcast we've been doing now for almost four years and it's very conversational. It's very fun. Uh, I'm trying to get myself to do more video, um, not just to diversify, but also because I realize how powerful it is. Right. I mean, it's one thing to hear someone's voice. It's another thing to see and read their words. Another thing entirely. I mean, the, the level of engagement you get, by not only hearing someone, but seeing them and seeing the way they react and seeing the facial expressions and the body language. Um, it's enormous. And I think in a world where we are trying to get prospects attention, like once you've got an engaged prospect, like, okay, fine. But most of us, the, the coin of the realm for marketing and sales is attention. And so why would you constrict the, your ability to get attention by limiting the 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 elements you can use in that communication and so i think that's one of many reasons why video has become more and more important um as a communication channel yeah it's uh you know we're starting to see something we've talked about for years which is this notion of organizations whether you're you know a small b2b company or or a large b2c uh, we need to be thinking like storytellers we need to be thinking like media companies and acting like media companies and i've i've, I've felt it you know no you know, no more than, than, you know, I am right now in the market and seeing how, uh, and it's really because of those behavior changes of individuals are, yeah, they're spending time listening to podcasts on their way to work or at the gym. Uh, they're watching short videos on their social channels as ways to consume and engage content. And it's almost like there's this sort of mix of um, education and entertainment, but not entertainment in the vein of, oh, I'm trying to make people laugh all the time or, you know, trying to scare them or, or like write a narrative story. But it's the it's almost the emotional attachment we have to something that is visual, is audible. It allows me to sort of get drawn into the story. And, and I think a lot of that is because of the psychology of, you know, how our, our brains, uh, you know, react to different, you know, formats of content. And I think now seems to be the time because, it's just so accessible. Now we can create videos, podcasts, we can create uh, other forms of content, we can create infographics, things like that, you know, much more readily than we ever have before. You mentioned the word entertainment, right? And I think there's plenty of marketers, especially older marketers that would, that just shake their head and say, what has happened to my profession? Like if we feel like we have to entertain people, but listen, I mean, if you're trying to get and keep someone's attention, you know, I think entertainment has to be a component of that. And, and it may be, you know, maybe entertainment has too much of a connotation with, you know, we're producing a TV show or we're trying to, you know, cartoons or whatever. But I think, you know, a level of fun, a level of not taking ourselves too seriously, creating something that people want to be a part of. I mean, you've probably heard me say before, and I, I, I stole this from someone. And I wish I knew who it was, but, you know, making your content, moving it from interruptive to irresistible, like making, you know, what if you could make your sales content something people wanted more of like it's totally possible right it's not just the relevance of the content it's also the presentation it's like how do you, by keeping someone's attention by being relevant but also being interesting and interesting is you know your personality it's the way that you present that content it's the format and the packaging um uh jay acunzo he's his whole business is around not just doing podcasts but creating shows i mean he's like screw it we're not just doing q a we're not just creating content marketing He's helping brands build shows um, and it's working exceedingly well for companies that are, you know, willing to take a little bit of a risk and have a little greater creative license with their content and create something that is entertaining. Like, why, why can't your content be entertaining? Why can't your marketing, why can't your sales approach be entertaining? Now, there's a difference between being annoying and having really dumb things that sort of waste people's time and, you know, and also insult our intelligence. There's a difference between that and being entertaining. Uh, as, as you know, as we, I'm, I'm smiling just because, you know, we have we have shared many a bad email uh, with each other from people that are have gone beyond entertaining, quite frankly. Diversity in content, integration of channels 
and new formats such as podcasts and videos, and maybe even daring to be fun and entertaining at times. As Matt said, it's all about a shift from interruptive to irresistible content experiences. Content so good, people would be willing to pay for it or would go out of their way to share it with others. You know, the other analogy I've heard someone, is people describe sort of tchotchkes, we all have our pens with logos and stuff on it. Someone once described me, said, you don't want a tchotchke, you want a pilferable. You want something so cool that people want to steal it, right? And, and the person I heard that from was actually creating, it was tchotchkes for bands where they would leave things in the green room for the band and they'd be like, this is cool. And they're like stealing, they think they're being cool and funny and stealing it. Like, no, we want you to take the vodka branded towel onto your tour bus and take it with you because we want you to buy more of that vodka, right? So, I mean, it's, it's a real thing to say, like, how do you make, you know, your content? How do you make your marketing? How do you make your brand something people can't get enough of? Yeah, we've uh, we've found within our own team, there's a few things that we've done within our own within our email marketing and just within our content strategy overall, uh, where we've we've had people actually respond back first, you know, first and foremost saying, thank you. Uh, I had one person say, you get me. And uh, and then uh, and actually thank us for some of the stuff we were creating. And uh, at one point, we actually had somebody, you know, who wasn't on our list email us saying, how do I get on your list? My colleagues are on it and I want to get what they're getting. And, uh, you know, that was the result of a couple of, of really impactful. We did like a personalized holiday video where I think somebody was genuinely laughing in the office and others wanted to look. But it's so uh, it's such a different environment that when you're creating that kind of experience for somebody, um, the chance for and I, I don't want to use the, the viral ver word loosely, but to me, that's like B2B virality. It creates that you know, word of mouth within your within your base, and it keeps those who are engaged um, engaged longer. And it sometimes it's just tone of voice, and sometimes it's just really you know thinking through that right message, right time, but also the right experience, which I think a lot of us tend to forget about. Well, if if we start with the idea and accept the notion that we shouldn't take ourselves too seriously, you can very quickly say, okay, if we're not going to take ourselves too seriously, then we don't have to talk about ourselves all the time. And if we're not if we're, if we're okay not talking about ourselves all the time, then maybe we can introduce content or a format that is loosely associated with us, but that gets, pe gets and keeps people's attention. I mean, if you go to our blog, if you go to our website and you search nachos, you will find probably three or four articles about nachos on our website. They were written by Maria. She's been with us for 11 years. She runs our client services team. She loves nachos. She literally every Friday night, she and her husband have nachos. And so she'll, she's published some best practices around nachos. Does that have anything to do with anything? No. But like, it's interesting. You know, I think about the old blend tech, they may still do it. Remember the will it blend videos where they like, I mean, they were, tr they were trying to promote the fact that they have these blenders that are indestructible, but also what was interesting, they're like, Hey, the new iPhone's out, will it blend? And so on video, they throw it into a blender and see what happens. And uh, it's crazy. Um, uh, who's, what's the, Andrew, Andrew Davis um, has done, has does a whole presentation on sort of the curiosity curve. And he starts by saying, like, people say that we have the attention, less of attention span of a goldfish. And it's ridiculous. Like, it, if you create something of interest, people will watch it. He showed a video and he kept coming back to it, this video of people that were putting a rubber band around a watermelon. And the whole point was how many rubber bands would it take to finally break the watermelon? This is like an hour and a half video. They did it on Facebook Live. And there were people that were literally writing in the comments like, damn you, I need to get back to work, but I can't stop watching you put rubber bands around a watermelon. And I guess part of the problem, I, I don't remember what the brand was they were promoting and I don't know what, whatever it was, but like, like how do you, how can you create your equivalent of that? That is sometimes just fun. Uh, Jason Miller, who, you know, was with, did content marketing for LinkedIn for forever. He used to talk about these five food groups of content and he would talk about your, your, your vegetables, right? Your fruits and vegetables every day. You got to eat enough every day. It's just your everyday content. He talked about your Sunday roasts, right? Which was these bigger, longer pieces of content. And he also talked about chocolate cake. He said, we all like chocolate cake. And sometimes like, what's the point of chocolate cake? Is There's zero, there's no actual point in chocolate cake. Like none of us should be eating chocolate cake because it has no nutritional value. We should all be using those calories somewhere else. But God damn it, chocolate cake, right? And so sometimes like having something that is just fun, that just shows you have a personality that just gets and keeps your prospects attention to have the next conversation you want to have, it, it's worthwhile. Well, here's the other thing you think about with video is, you know, if you've got, if you're trying to like present some hardcore message that people actually have to sit and watch for 40 minutes, like keeping someone's attention for 40 minutes on anything is really hard. 
most people, at least in a work environment, have multiple screens now. I mean, literally, I'm recording this and I've got I'm looking at you on my laptop. I got two other screens over here. So there have been times when like, you know, there's a ball game like the Cubs are playing or something. And I'll put the Cubs game on mute over here on this screen while I'm doing work over here. Well, couldn't I do that with someone putting rubber bands around a watermelon? And does that increase attention? I mean, you know, Al Wolf, the path factor, who we both know. You know, we talk about our lead scoring and we usually do lead scoring around, oh, someone downloaded the white paper or they clicked on this link. Well, the one thing we don't we don't follow enough in marketing is time. How much time did they spend with your content? How much time did they spend with your video? And there's passive time that has value. Like there may be people that are watching this podcast right now that are also doing other work, but they're listening. And every once in a while, they'll hear something from us or there'll be something in the video or something in the visual that sort of gets their attention. Maybe it's the jazz hands I'm doing right now, whatever it is that just sort of just pulls them back in for at least a few seconds, you know, but it's playing in the background and that, you know, would you rather have, say, I'm going to get 15 minutes of your time undivided, which the salespeople always want. Or would you put a video on for 45 minutes once a week that's kind of interesting and have it playing in the background while you while you multitask and do other things? And so as much as I can rail against multitasking, it exists. People do it. So why not take advantage of that and create something that people can have in the background that is from you, that is you, that helps build your credibility and trust with that prospect or customer? Mm. Chocolate cake. Mm. Who doesn't love chocolate cake? So what's the chocolate cake in your own marketing and sales strategy? What is that content, that tone of voice, or that campaign that makes your prospects and customers say, wow, that was truly satisfying. I loved that and I can't wait to get more of it. That is what being irresistible is all about. But before we explore this concept further, let's talk about the opposite of chocolate cake. Those things we do as marketers and sellers that feel interruptive not irresistible. Those messages and content that make our prospects want to unsubscribe and never hear from us again. Now, Matt's a bit of an expert on this topic as well. In fact, he maintains a folder of the really bad sales emails that he gets. You know, those messages that interrupt your day talking about something that's not at all relevant to you. So I asked Matt to read some of the ones he's received recently and to deconstruct why it is that these type of messages often do more harm than good when it comes to creating a connection. I'm not gonna name names, uh, but there's some good ones. So for those of you watching, I think by now you realize like I'm a, I'm a B2B marketing guy. Like I run a consulting firm for helping people with B2B marketing and sales. Okay, so here's an email. Um, hey, Innovation Excellence. That was, that was my name here. Hey, Innovation Excellence. We're looking for mom blogs and your name came up. See, here we're already getting good. We, I work for, company name. Uh, I, I work for a company name. We're an LA based lighting company. We're looking for bloggers to write about our lamps. Uh, and I'll, it goes on to say he'll give me a 15% commission for any sales that come in. So apparently my name is Innovation Excellence. I run a mom blog and they want me to write about lamps. One of my one of my all time favorites. The next this one is um, this is from a guy uh, who is, I can't remember what he was selling, but the email, sometimes just the subject line is the best subject line on this one is you didn't listen with an upside down smiley face. Um, love that one. Here's one where the subject line is, where is the love? Um, uh, where literally just circling back. Did you see my previous emails? Um, you know, one of the, one of the themes for a lot of these, uh, the thing that have in common is it's all about them. Right. There's no I mean, forget the fact that, that the guy thinks I'm a mommy blogger who wants to write about lamps. But like even if even if I was a mommy blogger that wants to write about lamps, like the guy's basically just saying, will you will you write about lamps? I'll give you 15 percent without any understanding of whether that's something that I am interested in. Um, uh, here's the subject line. Did you received it? A little uh, context issue. Greetings. I still have not heard from you. If you got our message regretting our offer, Ramon. That's the whole the whole thing. And so, look, we uh, someone told me recently that we that the average the average office worker, including us and probably most people listening, we spend uh, six point three hours a day in email, which is terrifying. Um, our work is in email. Our email is not work. But yeah, I mean, the, the spam issue is getting out of control. Like, I mean, we all get spam, and we do occasionally get emails. We occasionally get unsolicited emails that are actually quite valuable, right? And I think 
you know, either it's either intentional or accidental. Either someone actually targeted you the right way or there you are the 0.01% that they were trying to get in the first place, right? I am a mommy blogger and I do love lamps. And so, yes, I mean, I'm sure that there were some people that were like, hell yeah, send me some samples. But I think your, your ability as a marketer, your ability as a brand, your ability as a salesperson to create something that is not interrupted, but is irresistible. Something that is like, hey, wait, that's actually... Yes, I'd like to see more about that. Yes, I'd like to learn more about that. I hadn't expected to hear from that. Like all of our marketing and sales is by definition interruptive, right? I don't care if it's a referral or a warm introduction. You were not expected in front of that person today. So if you're going to start interruptive, which you have to in general, right? What is it that you're going to put in front of someone that's worth their time? If someone finishes reading your email, finishes watching this podcast, finishes talking to your sales rep, what does it take to get them to lean back in their chair and say, that's valuable. I would have paid for that. Like what of your content is worth paying for? What of your content is worth it to the fact that like the next time they see your name, the next time they see your brand, they're like, I don't know what they're about to say, but they're usually pretty funny or it's usually informative or it's usually worth my time. It doesn't take that much work. I mean, I think there's a lot of this marketing that we see is just so lazy and you the ability to sort of, take that same format and that same channel and create something that is about the prospect that is of interest to them that isn't about you and may not even be about your story, but just is about their story and about their interest to get their attention. Um, you know, I think the other challenge we have with a lot of these emails I'm looking at is people want, they want the opportunity right away. Like they want the demo call right away and prospects are never willing to go that fast. Like sometimes it takes three steps to get to, you know, three steps, sometimes three steps is faster than one to get to where you want to go. So you have to have the patience and discipline to do that. Um, and I and I feel like I can say this because, I mean, I think a lot of times people, well, you know, you're an ivory tower, you're a blogger, you're an influencer. No, I'm running a business. I have people over here that want their paychecks. I have to keep closing deals too. But I can't call up my pipeline here and say, well, some of these deals didn't close for Jan July. I need some of you to close. Hi, John. I know we talked last month. I need one of you to close. Can it be you? I mean, I can't do that. But that's that's what you see here all the time. And so, you know, put yourself in, in the, your prospect's shoes and understand, like, to get someone's attention, to get the deal, your timeline isn't theirs. But what are you going to do to actually sort of win the deal when it's ready? I feel like I should get off my soapbox now. <laughs> it's an important soapbox to be on, Matt. And I think, you know, a lot of us, we, we, we talk about this and I think we all know inherently, you know, we need to be smart about our messaging. It needs to be about them, not us. It needs right. to add value. It can't just be an ask. Uh, but I think you're right. A lot of organizations and individuals, uh, they're either they're either lazy or it's just because that's how they've done it. Right. And, and that's sort of, you know, just generally how they approach it. Um, and so all of you listening or watching, uh, I would challenge you right now uh, or in eight minutes from now when we finish this episode uh, to go and take a look at your own core communications, whether it be your, your email nurtures, if you're a marketer, take a look at what some of your sales reps are sending out and put it through that lens of, you know, if I were to receive this, right, even if you think it's pretty good, um, what could make it great? And, yeah. and to me, it's either to your point earlier, it's either the relevance um, of it. Uh, the value it delivers, mm -hmm. you know, and or the authenticity in the messaging. And I think any one of those can create a better bond with somebody in your in your community. Yeah. And when you nail all three of those together, it's authentic, it's relevant, and it offers value. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that, you know, yeah, they're not necessarily going to get, yes, I need to see a demo today, but they build the relationship that when they're looking for a solution that uh, you offer, you're going to be your, their first call. Absolutely. Now, I wanted to dive deeper into what Matt's own team is doing to create content that is relevant, authentic, and provides significant value to their community. In addition to all of those great blogs, videos, research, and social content his team produces on a daily basis, he's been running the Sales Pipeline Radio podcast for more than four years. And I think this is a perfect example of content worth paying for. So I asked Matt what he's learned about running a podcast and what the rest of us should know before diving in. Well, uh, I mean, we're still learning, obviously, as we go. I think, you know, we are very self-critical about all the elements of our content marketing and trying to make it better. I think one thing I've learned is just to be patient. Um, you know, it took us a long time to really build an audience. And when we launched four years ago, we already had an audience. We had a decent number of people on our blog and pretty good followers on social. 
but we were starting a format from scratch. And so getting that to a point where people were following it, I think getting to a critical mass of episodes that were discoverable on Google with a wide variety of topics and um, and just doing the de- the discipline every week of getting it done, but also like, you know, picking the right, you know, guests who are going to have good things to say, who can help promote it, you know, doing the pre-promotion and the post-promotion and having a real engine behind that. So I think, you know, like a, sort of a summarizing, I guess, a lot of the stuff we've been talking about, right? Like, you know, having something that has a level of entertainment value um, has, you know, finding guests that are going to provide interesting content and value to our audience but then also being really disciplined about doing it again and again and again. I see a lot of people that start podcasts, don't have a regular steady discipline of how they're doing it um, and give up on it too early. And so I think for us, it's just been a little bit of just sticking with it of doing, you know, continuing to refine things, but doing the right things over and over again. Um, And also cross promoting. it. I mean, you know, you, every one of our uh, episodes, there's a transcript that is created and ultimately posted on our, on our blog. Uh, you know, we're promoting them on social and we're picking guests that can help cost promote that on social as well. Um, increasingly, you know, we also pick guests that we think are good prospective customers. So I'm looking at my ABM list. I'm looking at my named account list and finding CMOs that um, I don't have a relationship with yet and either in, in inviting them directly. And if I don't hear from them, going to their PR firm and asking their PR firm if they'd like their client to be on sales pipeline radio. And, you know, some that's not a hundred percent conversion rate, but you know, I'm using it as a biz dev channel as well to get to know people um, that I don't know otherwise. So it's, um, you know, knowing, knowing that it, I, I can't look at the podcast ever and say, well, how much pipeline came out of it? Um, just like I can't do that for a blog post or a tweet or something. But it's been a really, really important diversification of our content strategy. And I think the format we use also makes it really easy from a production standpoint. It's like this. I mean, like, I think, you know, you, you, we had a few ideas of what we were going to talk about. And you may have a list of questions there, but I did very little prep time. And so my, my goal is to make it so my guests on the podcast have to do very little, if any, prep. And that I make it fun and conversational, which I think makes it fun and interesting for uh, people listening as well. Yeah, and I think in the spirit of of creating connections, uh, I've I've found similar things where it's an incredible opportunity to actually have a different kind of conversation with somebody who they may be a prospect, they may be a customer, they may be a partner, um, but having them in this format is almost a forcing function to to have an interactive conversation like real people where you're not talking about product, you're not talking about a, a sales process, and it's uh, it goes a long way for relationship building and then downstream the audience uh, itself has an opportunity to, you know, sort of, again, develop a much more personal connection to yourself and, and your brand. So um, I think if you can, if you can, if you can do it in a way that, uh, you know, is going to actually deliver value to your audience, and it's not just, you know, the latest tactic to try to get more leads, uh, then I think it's something that that uh, a lot of people I know already are thinking about and, and others will continue to. Well, the other thing I think we, we, you know, it was not intentional, but I think is an element of making the podcast something people think is interesting is it's not just all about the, the B2B conversation. Like when we start off, like I have a producer that will sort of kick us off and usually we'll have a two to three minute conversation about something. Um, he's, he is in, um, he, he works out of Southern California and he complains, uh, he will frequently complain about the rain. And so I make fun of it and say, well, I'm really sorry. You have to deal with your beach drizzle. Um, you know, and like, sometimes we'll talk about like, you know, college football. He's a big, um, you know, university of Minnesota fan, which is, you know, which is really easy to make fun of because they always suck and, uh, at football. So I think, um, you know, I think there's a level of that. I mean, you think about, you know, when you listen to a good, you know, radio show, like a drive time morning show, it's like, you know, they do the same thing. They just talk about random stuff in the midst of what, you know, they sh- should be talking about. And so I think that's part of what makes it sort of entertaining and interesting. So in the spirit of making podcasts more personal and conversational, I did a bit of digging on Matt and what his interests are outside of the office. And one thing that stood out to me is that Matt makes his own homemade bacon. And I couldn't resist asking him to draw an analogy between making irresistible bacon and creating irresistible content. Tyler, the hardest part about making bacon is waiting for the bacon. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, sometimes you'll look at a recipe and it'll give total time and hands-on time, you know, and with bacon, making bacon, the hands-on time is about 20 minutes and the total time is about a week and a half, you know, because I mean, you're going to, you're, you're going to start with a, a pork belly. You're going to make very quickly make a, a salt and sugar rub. You're going to put it in the fridge for a week. 
and let it do its thing, right? You can't have bacon right away. You can't have good bacon right away. Like you can speed up the process, but you know, the natural forces that recreate, that take a, you know, a raw pork belly and change the chemistry inside to make it a cured meat. You can't fast forward the smoking process. You can go buy a bottle of liquid smoke at the grocery store this afternoon. It will not be the same as a thin blue wisp of cherry wood smoke enveloping that piece of bacon for five hours over about 200 degrees. Like you cannot speed that up. So I guarantee you, you cannot have high quality bacon quickly. You can have crappy adequate bacon more quickly, but is that really what you want? You know? And so I guess the analogy there would be if you want good clients, if you want a great pipeline, if you want great lasting relationships with the right prospects, it's not just finding those prospects in the wild. It's getting to a point where they are ready to buy, where they are ready to engage, where they will engage with you. No matter how good your sales process is, you cannot speed up the process of when that prospect is ready to buy. So the anecdote is bigger pipeline, but with those individual prospects, there's a level to which you got to leave them in the fridge for a week. You got to let them sit on the smoker for five hours. But if you're willing to invest the time and be disciplined enough to do that, you'll end up with what you want. You'll end up with something that is ultimately better than what you would have sped up to get. And if How's you've that taken analogy? the oh, it's beautiful. And if you've <laughs> taken the time to put the care into it mm-hmm. and to build a relationship with that meat, I mean that prospect. Yes. Then yes. Uh, it's uh, then they're going to come to you when their time is right. And I think that's uh, a great way to close this one out here. Uh, one of the big important pieces of creating connections through entertaining and educational content is that you know that longer term, when that individual is ready to buy they are going to know where to go and find the best bacon. Absolutely. With that, Mr. Hines, thank you so much for joining me here today. Uh, where can people find more about yourself or uh, you know, get in, uh, in touch to find your great content and yeah, your so, podcast? Um, we're just at HeinzMarketing.com, H-E-I-N-Z, like the ketchup marketing. Um, I'm Matt at Heinz Marketing. We're on Twitter at, at Heinz Marketing. The podcast, you can find links to it on our website. You can also just go to SalesPipelineRadio.com. Um, and you can find all of our, I don't know how many past episodes we have up there as well as new episodes. So yeah, that's where you can find us. Between the delicious chocolate cake, the slow cooked bacon, and the conversation about irresistible content, this has easily been the most savory episode of Creating Connections to date. And it's a great reminder that when it comes to engaging our skeptical and time-starved audiences, we need to offer content that is of greater value, is more authentic, and does more to earn their trust. Content so good, they'd be willing to pay for it. Because when we do it right, we open opportunities to connect with our buyers on a more human level and to ultimately become a brand they find simply irresistible. Thanks for joining us on Creating Connections, brought to you by the fine folks here at Vidyard. If you enjoyed the show, give it a like or a share, hit that subscribe button for future episodes, and check out the podcast version now available on your favorite podcast platform.